So, let me tell you something that you should have already realized by now about this fucking show you're listening to. This shit is supposed to be for mature audiences. As in grown-ups, mentally mature. It's supposed to talk about adult subjects, an adult frame of mind. It's not fucking that at all. This is two emotionally regressed, broken half-whips pretending to offer insight on movies. All they really offer you is an endless sexual perversion and a laundry list of personal paraphilia issues. You can make your own choices in life, but you have to choose this as entertainment. You know you're better than this. You have to know you are better than listening to Cinema Psyops. Consecutive week of Cinema PsyOps. I'm your host, Court, the guy who is relying very heavily on every hemp extract he can get his hands on to keep himself sane and to not attack every single one of you fuckers out there. And one of the victims of my possible wrath could be my co-host, Matt! This is why I don't leave the house anymore. I just stand home. Yeah, I'm actually, like, I, I really disliked us recording separately, but now I am slow walking the gig that I'm using as an excuse to not get you back into the studio. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying, man. It's it's nice being at home. <laughs> Here's what's really nice about after the show, because I, I also love uh, doing the show in person, but uh, the 20-minute uh, drive home late at night is, is you know... <laughs> 
Now, now it's just a short walk up to my bed. I face plant in it, and I go to Dreamland for a while. Yeah, we almost need to set up a better recording rig at your house, other than the snowball yeah. that you bought for your son when he decided he didn't want to be a podcaster immediately afterwards. That you then yeah, usurped yeah. for your own year. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. I was like, all right, well, I guess it's mine now. <laughs> <laughs> you quote unquote bought it for your son. I quote unquote, yes, I did. It's all right. He's gotten plenty of other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that. That was the original intention because you were. Yeah, it was. It was for my son uh, a few years ago, and he just kind of fell out of it. And I was like, all right, well, thank God I still bought it because COVID hit and I had it. So, (laughs) Well, we found a way to make it work either way. And there were times when you would hook up the snowball when we would be recording from home or I would have you record from home just because it was easier that week or snow days or whatever. And yeah, I mean, I've kind of gotten used to it. I think like maybe now we should just start doing actual video chats so we can actually look at each other and gauge responses. But even then, like, I, I don't know. Like it's like you said, it's a twenty-minute drive from your house to my house, so it's a forty-minute round trip to do the show, which adds to the two hours that yeah. we normally record See, the show. At. Then by the time we're done with the show, I'm usually exhausted. I'm sure you are too. That I'm driving home and I'm like, and it's middle, you know, it's like ten o'clock at night, and I'm just like, fuck. It's just so much easier, you know, get on and done in here, and I just walk upstairs and pop a fistful of melatonin just so I can knock myself out and not think for you know a couple minutes and not have my anxiety just choked me to death. I'm glad melatonin anyway. works for you. It does not work for me. I'm up to about 100 milligrams a night of CBD just to put my ass out for four hours. Sometimes I have nice. to do 200. Like I have to do for four hours at in the time to put me out Ooh. and to keep me out. Yeah, I'm having to up my melatonin as well. And uh, the wife keeps telling me that I shouldn't do that. But listen, I need to need that ability to fall asleep. I need something to shut my brain off because it doesn't go on its own anymore. And it just keeps going and going. And uh, if it allowed it to, I'd be like one of those kids in Nightmare on Elm Street. And I would be just fucked. <laughs> yeah, um, I have been combating my own issues with insomnia and particularly an anxiety driven insomnia where your brain yeah. just won't shut off. Um, so I totally feel where you're coming from there. And I'll I'll freely share it. Yeah, I've, uh, I mean, I don't do it all the time, but there are some nights where I cannot fall asleep and I'm like probably about 200 milligrams of CBD deep by four in the morning, hoping to get four hours of sleep before I get up the next day. Yeah, I'm, my problem is it put me out, but if I wake up for whatever reason, go to the bathroom and unless I can fall asleep right away after going to the bathroom, if my brain even kicks in a little bit, it's done. There's been plenty of times I've woken up at like three, three in the morning and then that's just been it. And I've just been up sitting there staring at the ceiling wondering where I went wrong. So, uh, <laughs> we're, we're going to have to get you some CBD and see how that treats you. And yeah, I, I, it's I, I've worked used really CBD. well for me for going to sleep. And it's helped me. Uh, it's helped me as well. Yeah. I, I, I've, cause I've used like CBD gummies before and stuff like that and Delta eights and all that. And, it, and it's helped. It has that, that stuff definitely also helps. Yeah. Well, the, the Delta eight is like a THC, uh, active stuff that's hemp derived and is legal mm-hmm. pretty much everywhere. It feels yeah. kind of, it feels kind of cool to realize that, um, <laughs> the cabinet they found the loophole. Have, have found yet another loophole to get a version of THC, which is somewhat psychoactive that can go to any state yeah, because it, it's it, hemp it derived you, and the farm to bill let it go. I did it and it. I, I took some because I got some at a local place and uh, yeah, you know, it, I mean, it's not like like an, an edible edible, but it, it makes you feel a certain way and calms calms me down at least. It calms me down to the point where I can relax and not um, yeah, it's not lose psycho- my fucking it, it, mind. Yeah, it's definitely not a psychoactive thing. Listen to us sounding mm-hmm. like we're uh, fucking selling this stuff like here I know, right? it's like, link. I, yeah i actually literally don't own any stock in it so you can actually take my just my opinion for what it, what it's worth just a fucking opinion but i have nothing to gain from you doing it or not doing it yeah basically what we're getting at here folks is that this is just the uh, trials and tribulations of guys trying to make it work when weed's not legal recreationally in their state oh yeah that's that now that's the god's honest truth <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean the delta eight stuff i've tried to i've i've gotten like those oil cartridges cartridges of it and um you know basically like you said it just it's not very psychoactive for me it's more of just calms me down and keeps me from mm-hmm. being super angry and uh yeah so like I've been telling, like I told you, I let go of a bunch of rage and stuff. And, you know, uh, I told everybody in the audience that too, but I've had more stuff kind of like surface on me. And uh, so what's kind of happening is as my brain's like, oh, you dealt with that. Here's your next load of shit. You're going to deal <laughs> with it. Oh, good job. You dealt with that. I'm proud of you. And <laughs> some more. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's like, it's like, oh, you're at, you're at peace. You're, you're happy. You're, you're starting to forgive people and you're, mm-hmm. you're starting to move on with your life and try to enjoy what's left. Here's some more fucking memory for you how do you feel about that you little shit like that's not on our watch you son of a 
bitch. Right, that's literally what my brain just did to me, and it just pushed a bunch more of that shit out. So yeah. now I get to sort through that, but I'm I'm tired of doing it alone, man. I need to get somebody else to help me lift these fucking bricks off my back. Yeah, man. I fuck. Yeah, mine's never anger. I'm I'm not as angry as I'm just I'm constantly anxiety ridden. The older I get, right. And this is um, not this is not something that I am proud of. I don't want to make it sound yeah. like I'm bragging. Yeah, I'm not, and, and Matt can attest to it. When I yeah. go off, it is horrifying because you're, you're pretty bad. You're worried I won't stop, and I'm yeah. worried. I won't stop. I just sit back and, you know, I watch you go. The best is just to be quiet and watch you do it. Um, <laughs> yeah, from, I'm not talking. From my own I'm experience. Not, I'm not talking just verbally, though. Like, but when I'm ready to unload, like yeah. when, it, when, oh, yeah. it, when it fucking goes. Yeah. Like, it's bad. Yeah, and, yeah it, it does. It, yeah, it gets bad. But yeah, mine is just silent horrificness. Just thinking about the mistakes I've made in my life and how it's affected my loved ones constantly. So I've heard, like, it, I've, I've heard it stated before that anxiety is essentially anger turned inward, which is what I would say you're doing to yourself. And I've, I've That's definitely, probably it. And I, I definitely see it as well. Like I am as impatient as I am with the rest of humanity. Just imagine how immediate yeah, I you, must be to satisfy my own. Yeah. You're 10 times worse on yourself. <laughs> I mean, I think that's kind of why we hang out a lot or at least we're, we, we can talk to one another. It's the fact that we're just, we're kind of, we got kind of the same shit going on, I think in our lives. Our fucked so. up brains are what makes us friends because we have literally yeah. nothing other than the podcast and the movies that we now have in common upon seeing yeah. together for the show. We had really not much, if anything, in common other than the fact that we both recognized that we were fucked up and yeah. like like the same kind of humor. Like that's what we yeah that we over. liked a, a bit of a darker darker form of humor. <laughs> uh, we we find a lot of humor in pain. <laughs> You know, so I mean, I think the best, I, honestly, I think the best comedians do. That's why so many yeah. of them have the the turnover rate that they do in not and the living problems that they have. And yeah, and the problems with drugs and alcohol and all that. Mm -hmm. I think the best comedy comes from a place of pain and it's, it's a way of smoothing over and spackling the open source, you know, and, and people and, love it. Most people find that comedy very funny because. Every, every, almost everyone has some sort of pain that they're dealing with. And when you got somebody up on a stage talking about pain, maybe it's pain that even you kind of identify with. It helps you to laugh because they're making fun of it. So somehow, maybe even just a little bit, it takes a little bit of the power away from that pain. Yeah. So when a comedian gets up on stage and talks about how they're so terribly horrible and undateable and their life is such a mess, the part of you that's inside that questions whether or not that's you they're talking about up there. <laughs> starts to laugh and enjoys the fact that Jesus Christ at least I'm not them at least my at least it's not that much of a mess they get up there and make fun of themselves yeah. to make us feel better and that's or, or you can sit up there and go oh it's not just me <laughs> right, I'm not alone yeah I don't feel so bad now right like because you do actually I'm identify not the only the, right I'm not the only fuck up <laughs> <laughs> right. And I, I think podcasting by and far is an extension of that for us because we aren't funny enough to actually do stand up. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> no, that's 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 a, that's that's true. That's true statements you're making there. But can we can we make fake radio on the fucking internet and still yeah. fuck that up and somehow still make it funny and good to listen to for folks that want to enjoy that sort of thing? Yeah, we do that. You, you goddamn right we can. 324 <laughs> goddamn weeks of it. Now here's your fucking break cuz we're about to talk autopsy in this piece. This will keep you quiet. <laughs> Oh, hi there. I didn't see you. You call me Cutting a New Show. I'm Bo Ransdell, and I'm one of the many creators you can find on Legion Podcasts. I said quiet! My fellow podcasters and I work hard to bring you the best in horror podcasting, but that comes at a cost. What's that like to live deliciously? Not that, but also yes. No, what I'm getting at is that there are server costs costs for good microphones and software for editing, all the things that make our shows, you know, fun to listen to. And you can help. If you're enjoying the shows on legionpodcasts.com or in the Legion Network available on iTunes and Stitcher, just about anywhere you can download a podcast, really, you can help us out and get a little something for your trouble at patreon.com forward slash Legion Podcasts. For just two bucks a month, you get a pair of movie commentaries exclusive to Patreon, and for five dollars, you can also join us for a monthly screening of a movie. All of that available on patreon.com forward slash Legion Podcasts. We appreciate it, and thank you for listening. Now, back to the cutting room.
So if you are listening in on the Pirate Radio Edit, this week we are bringing you the death metal band, or proto-death metal band, however you want to fuck on label it. They existed, they had a sort of growly sound going, and they were before a lot of other bands that were declared death metal, so call it whatever the fuck you want. The name of the band is Autopsy. They took their name directly from the fucking movie Autopsy. Really? Yes. So one of the main folks that was involved in the band Autopsy apparently is a huge fan of this film, and therefore named his band after it, and I can't fucking blame him after listening to this goddamn trailer. This is where the dead become the living. Ah! Autopsy. You know your corpses, but I know my souls. Ah! A savage slashing rampage inside the chamber of terror where death lives. Ah! Autopsy. It'll take you apart. <laughs> Autopsy. It will take you apart. It will take you apart. <laughs> All right, man. Well, fuck it. Autopsy, right? 1975's Autopsy. Let's do this. Let's do it. All right. So, first 20 starts out. Uh, we see a young woman slit her own wrist. A guy puts a bag over his head and jumps into a river. We see another guy blows himself up in his car. And we see another dude who's killed two of his kids and then shoots himself with an Uzi right in the gut. So, he really wanted to suffer and die. Okay, so this film is like not even 60 That's, seconds in yet yeah, that we get yeah. all of this in like one giant opening sequence. And I'm like, Jesus this, Christ, is it all going to yeah. be this fucking intense? Yeah, because you see a couple of dead kids within one minute. You're like, the fuck? Right. I was like, God damn, I'm really going to like this movie. And Matt's going to fucking hate it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this, this is pretty. This is some uh, monstrous stuff we're having right here. Yeah, I'm fucking in. Like, all already i'm excited so i'm just gonna shut the fuck up and move on but i just wanted to stress that that's like within the first 60 seconds yeah it's uh it's definitely something else uh that's for sure <laughs> it was fucking intense um, yeah really intense and then we see a woman and she meets up with the uh, gentleman and he apologizes for being late and they get in the cab and she starts crying um then we cut to the morgue the city morgue and it's piling up with a lot of dead body um we see um this creepy dude tries to hit on one of the female doctors there he's uh he's real creepy and um, what in a morgue no yeah, yeah right and uh she see she can tell she's been working a lot she's tired she's hallucinating um she's keeps seeing like a corpse getting up smiling i don't know yeah. whether it comes through that well or not but um on the projector like the big 120 inch thing when i'm screening the movies on my theater room uh -huh. um, it that large you can see everybody's sweaty it's fucking hot you can see heat lines yeah. on things yes like, it's it's, obvious. you can tell it is very very much supposed to be put out there that it is very hot outside. Yeah, so it, it could is. be heat exhaustion and she could be overworked on top of that, but she's clearly yeah. suffering from heat exhaustion. You can see it in her face. She's very flush and sweaty and like everybody is really, really just overly heated and that's kind of part of the cause of the suicides from what the intro was implying too. Yes. Um, well, she keeps having these visions of uh, her, um, of these uh, the, the cadaver getting up and boning one another and just walking around. Fucking um, hot! <laughs> then she she decides, okay, it's time to... She's washing up. She's washing her face. Um, and uh, the creepy doc says, hey, you need to check this body. And when he unveils it, it's actually a friend of hers. And he's doing so. He's like sticking out his tongue, being weird. And she freaks out. Well, anyway, later on, that same friend drives her home. And he tries... He comes on to her. And she's like, you know, I'm not really ready for that yet. And then he kind of assaults her in the car. She gets out, but apparently that doesn't really matter to her, so... I don't know why, but okay. Yeah, we need to talk about this. Yeah. In this day and age, particularly in Europe, apparently, that wasn't considered sexual assault. That was considered trying to seduce. Forcing yourself like that without, like, fully sealing the deal and eventually accepting no, like, when it gets really, really, like, you know, dramatic no, that was considered yeah. seduction or attempting to seduce, right? Which is still yeah, fucking okay. sexual That's, assault. I mean, it's still fucked up. Right, but... right. But, like, it's more socially acceptable back then that this was, like, a way that, you know, couples would go at it with each other. Um, yeah. Obviously, she's still upset and just tired and had enough. And then that prank that he pulled is just like, you know, sent around the bend. 
And they might have some kind of weird game that they like to play where, you know, he does get more assaulty with her. And, you know, she has a certain point where she'll put up with that. We don't even know. But like everything the film is trying to show us here with this couple, it's like, yeah, that's way too far. But then again, we don't have context on whether or not this is them as a couple playing or not either. You know, yeah. she's still with the guy. So clearly she doesn't feel like she doesn't feel that, I guess, scared or unappreciated. Uh, right. But then again, like this film is also ultra fucking rapey because it's a 70s Italian film and a giallo at that. So strap in because like even good characters can be rapey in giallos and it's fucking awful. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've noticed that about the giallos we have watched. So, oh, we haven't even done strip nude for your killer, which is like way fucking worse with that kind of shit. Yeah. It sounds like it. Jesus Christ. Um, anyway, just tip fair warning, man. Like these, these are, these murder mysteries may be really bloody and fun and giallos may be kind of fun to talk about, but there's a bit of a minefield with some of them like this. Agreed. Um, uh, that night she's, uh, later on that night, she's doing some, she's doing some paperwork or writing something. She's typing something. She's very hot. You can tell it's very hot where they are. Well, she gets a late night caller and it's a lady from upstairs and who is also in the taxi from earlier. And that's our first clip. You don't know me. Could I talk to you a minute? Hi. I know it's an awkward time to disturb someone, but I saw you out on the terrace and... From where? I'm up on the third floor. Actually, I want to borrow an envelope. Thank you. So you live upstairs. I must say, of all my father's girlfriends, you stand out like a ray of sunshine. Here it is. Here's your envelope. Orange? Oh, it'll do, I guess. Thanks. But I don't know your father. Who is he? Some divine man? My father? He's a funny man. With a weakness for Americans. Blondes, brunettes, and redheads. <laughs> My mother was the first. American, of course. May I take... Mm-hmm. Thanks. Um, what did you say your father's name was? I didn't say, but it's written on his door in great big block letters. Johnny Sanna. You're his guest, didn't you know? Uh, no, I didn't really. When a girlfriend gave me the key in Florence, she just said, when you go away, put it under the mat. When are you going away? Tomorrow, home, Pennsylvania. I've had it with camping out in strange apartments. Thanks. Don't tell me you get your kids from this stuff. My interest is pretty professional. Are you a doctor? That's right. You must be pretty smart. I wish I'd met you earlier. Do you mind if I stay a little longer? Maybe I ought to tell you something. It's sort of a secret. I mean, you're an American, aren't you? <laughs> I'm only half American. But if I can well, help you. Is that upstairs? Sounds like it. I'll be right back. Wait for me. Well, our redheaded friend gets a phone call. She answers the call, says uh, that she, she doesn't, she says not tonight, and she hangs up and she looks very, very afraid, very nerve wracked right now. So, whatever's happening uh, for her isn't good. Um, well, she leaves that night, and a guy walking his dog tells her to be careful out there. Simona, who was our lead character there, watches her leave, um, and then tears a pickup of one of the bodies that she had, so she kind of just had a freak out. Um, so we see, uh, Red is going through the street. She passes by two drunks who one tries to tackle her and she just gets away. Then we see her talking to a priest. Then as she's walking, uh, a car pulls up and she apparently knows this person. Then we cut to the next day and two life cards find a dead body. Well, we see the woman is, came up. She has shot herself apparently in the head. Pretty gruesome makeup done here. Uh, yeah. The holes in the head and through the jaw and the way that they do it the the mold of the person's face and the way the eyeball is sticking out everything about it is grotesque but like it's it took me a second to realize when they weren't on the actress's face and they were on the mannequin so you could see through the holes and stuff mm -hmm. and i i feel that alone is like the highest compliment i can pay to the fake head that they made like where i couldn't really tell when it was the actress with the makeup that looked like the hole on the one side you know without the light shining through and then okay. when, when it was the actual dummy head that they were picking up you know what i mean like obviously when 
when they push the eyeball back in, it's the actual actress. But then they go back to the head and they show the entrance and the exit one and there's daylight through there. And it was fucking incredible. It looked really cool. Yeah. Right. Jesus. And it's it's grotesque um, to phrase it that way, but that's what they built. And that's how it looked. And it was amazing. It was so well done. Yeah. Yeah, it looked really good. It was grotesque, uh, too. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, it was just, exactly. It was so well crafted and so like so detailed. <laughs> you have to yeah. you have to admire that level of craftsmanship. Well, then uh, the creepy doc he uh, feels her up a bit, and uh, yeah, even the corpses get molested in this film. Yeah. Well, she walks up, then uh, looks over the body and just has this sneaking feeling she knows this woman. The woman looks almost like her because she has short blonde hair. Um, she's apparently working on a thesis about killers and such. Um, so the creepy doctor, he's apparently really good at reconstruction, and he begins reconstructing the face, which makes her even think she knows her even more. Well, later on, she goes to meet her dad. He tells her he's getting married. Uh, throughout this whole thing while they're talking, she keeps having weird episodes. And then she runs into, I would say, more like a friend of me. It's her dad's ex-girlfriend. She's wearing a red wig, and when the girl confirms that, she gets even more horrified and leaves and that's the end of the first 20 minutes. All right, within the first two minutes of this film, we have yeah. full-fledged uh-huh. nudity, we can say thank you, movie two, where the lady is kind of getting cleaned up in the sink and her boobs are out because that's just us observing her cleaning herself and that's what the film wants to show us, so that's nudity we're okay to see with. That is before the first two minutes of this film. The first 60 seconds of this film are horrendous displays of death and suicide and like super fucking depressing. Yeah, right. <laughs> and Jesus. then all the stuff in the morgue is like pretty intense and pretty like like really well detailed stuff uh that they were doing for what the autopsies would look like when they're doing like the organ removals and things like that it's grotesque it is really really just very realistic and it makes me kind of wonder if they actually filmed some autopsy footage and threw it in the film because yeah. um a lot of these organs do not look like they were recreated they look like actual fucking organs being washed off and handled and the film stock kind of changes a little bit but i'm not i'm not saying that's definitely what they did i'm just saying like i wouldn't be shocked if that's what they did where they just put actual autopsy footage in they could have yeah yeah it's i mean i really i don't know but the actual bodies where they had the wounds like the larger woman with the stab wounds all through her abdomen and chest those stab wounds looked like actual like blood cleaned off just body left behind stab wounds that i've seen in not you know up close and personal but like that i've seen like in stuff about autopsies and you know the csi stuff you know where the investigations of crimes crime scene photos that sort of thing like the stab wounds looked believable somebody must have really studied what those wounds would look like once they were cleaned off and it was just the decayed flesh you know it was really interesting the detail work that they did in all the makeup and we've already kind of talked about that with that gunshot wound um which was definitely like the cornerstone of all of the effects i don't know if it gets any better than that i I don't know what do you think no i mean it was pretty grotesque so yeah i'm with you on that um this whole movie does a pretty good job of of grossing you out when you you, when when they want to i think the thing it does about it is it's not it's not attempting to do it very salaciously i mean clearly the autopsy stuff and all in that is it's meant to make you sick it's meant to gross you out it's meant to throw you off your game but also it's meant to bring you into this world unanesthetically and just like just basically like drop you into this world that this woman lives in and just basically you're either going to adapt or you're going to be horrified the entirety of the film which means that it's successful in its nature of being a horror film because you will be horrified the entire time because even on her normal daily routine she's cutting up fucking bodies and it's kind of grotesque work (laughs) and the uh, effects that are done in the film are just so matter of fact and just laid out and pretty realistic and I think the film handles it almost documentarian with that stuff like it doesn't feel other than the one creepy morgue attendant guy who does the feeling up and the touching all the other stuff feels very clinical and very just straightforward and just very uncaring and I think that makes that autopsy footage that much more disturbing in that it's literally how you're handled after you're dead because you're just tissue at that point and it's just so uncaring and so so utilitarian and just so empty and they don't even take a time to recognize that that was a human being because they didn't got time for that they got to get through all these fucking bodies and perform autopsies well, and I, i'm pretty sure people the, the the medical people who have to perform autopsies they can't spend time going oh god this was a person or else they'll go 
insane. Right, right. You have to be detached and everything like yeah. that. And what I'm getting at is for someone who is not detached like yourself, being forced into this world and seeing all of this and having it happen, of course it's going to be grotesque for you. So yeah, much more true. so yeah. than, than someone that this would be their world. And I think the film does that intentionally. But I also feel like they could have made it way more salacious and way more fucking out there and way more grotesque and made that that molesty clerk guy that was like all feeling up that body they could have made him way more worse if they wanted to go they just acknowledge that's the thing that happens where the guy will cop a feel you know and try and play it off like it's no big deal even though that is a huge violation of a code of ethics and a bunch of other things for the type of work that he's doing yeah even still you know there you go but oh, yeah. the way the yep, film yep. The, the way the film sets it up this first 20 minutes it lets you know that yeah you're going to be in for a fun murder mystery of a ride because we already you know this corpse had a familiar your face that's a that's the fucking that's a giallo title right there this corpse has a familiar face yeah right <laughs> right so i mean because of that you know you're in for a ride and a murder mystery and all of that stuff it just so happens that we started at the point of the morgue and since we had to start there, the film is going to start in some really deep, dark territory. And it's going to be interesting to see how they try to bring it out and, and bring it up at least a little bit, because we're going to be in this morgue a lot, we can tell. And yet they have to entertain us and keep us going for the hour and what, 40-ish minute runtime that we have ahead of us? Like, yeah. like okay, so we got like an hour and 20 minutes left ahead of us. We got the first 20 minutes in, and this has been really fucking grim. And I know part of me was like, Jesus, is it going to be this intense for like a good portion of this movie? And yes. <laughs> And the answer is, yeah, kind of, but it does lighten up slightly. Yeah, kind of. Well, we start the next 20 minutes. She heads back to the morgue and she actually puts a red wig on the lady's body. She's then interrupted by her superiors. And that is our next clip. Mr. Silvestri, uh, I, I was trying to steal your job. I am. Um, I found a red hair on the body this morning from a wig. So I, I thought I'd buy one and try it. <sighs> Dr. Sanna's writing a thesis on the differences between simulated and authentic suicides. And this case looks like it could have come right out of a textbook. Yes. Well, we've run all the tests. Paraffin glove, powder burns at the point of entry, all positive. It wasn't a suicide. Her name was Betty Lennox. She was 23 years old. She came from Pennsylvania. She was murdered. Can you prove that? No. Excuse me, Father, but what makes you so sure? The path of the bullet, the circumstances, indicate suicide. You know your corpses, but I know my souls. I confessed this girl only minutes before what you call her suicide. And she could not have killed herself because I had given her absolution. And she had returned to the grace of God. You may have a knowledge of souls, but that doesn't qualify you to dispute scientific fact, Father. Especially when the soul is a woman's. I've known this woman's soul since she was a child. My name's Lennox, too. I'm her brother. Well, then. Um, we see Simona. She leaves, and the Padre wants a ride, but he also wants to drive. He drives pretty crazily, um, and they end up at the beach, where he says it's the scene of the crime. Uh, she's really not interested in even seeing any of this, and she drives off. She takes off on him. Well, we see her friend who drove her home, who I will just call, you know, uh, her dude from now on. I never really got his name. Well, he's standing there taking pictures in the city of, like, statues and in the buildings, and he sees her, and they talk a little bit. Um... And they talk about Red and how, you know, that was her, uh, you know, who was brought in. And he thinks that he had heard the name before, Lennox. Well, uh, he, uh, takes her back to his place. And, uh, she, she, she says she, you know, she asks him to, uh, undress her. And so he does. And, uh, they start almost getting to Bone Town, but then she has visions of the corpses and screams and kind of loses it. And she has some pretty serious PTSD right here about something um yeah her brain's trying to process the corpse with a familiar face that's what's going yeah. on but also she's overworked she's kind of had heat stroke and she's in the middle of the morgue with heat stroke which is probably the worst place you could ever get heat stroke is a morgue yeah well they uh, uh they talk uh a little bit the dude actually remembers the name lennox that was a race car driver who got in an accident and killed 12 people at the racetrack he went into apparently as he put it the loony bin well then she gets home and uh she goes goes back home and sees that nice dog from before but its owner is the caretaker of the place and he's a creepy fuck and she says that the heat must be warping his brain 
<laughs> Pretty much every dude in this movie is a pervy weirdo in one point or another. Yeah. Yeah. And then she, uh, we see the creeper meets actually with her dad. He delivers something to him, but we don't see what it is. Um, at that night, he's uh, taking his dog for a walk and he sees someone sneaking about the building. So he sends his dog after him. Well, we see it's the priest and the dog gets to him, but he's able to fight him off. He fights with the caretaker. That gets to be like a real serious fucking fight. Is this uh, the part they... where he starts screaming about killing him and stuff? Yes. Well, he's and killed he gets, like a lot of people I've killed and shit. a lot yeah. of people already. So, you know, all that kind of stuff. Then Simona yells at him and he snaps back and he goes back into her apartment with her and they talk talk in our next clip it's my sister's bracelet i found it in the cogs of one of those machines they used to clean the beach with somebody tore it off and threw it away in the sand just as this beach chair and the bathing suit are also part of some setup to keep it from being identified right away you see you ever killed betty didn't realize that there was anybody in rome that could identify her i mean this gunshot too Try to destroy her features. I mean, a beautiful girl doesn't kill herself like that. You're an expert on suicides, real ones and fake ones. You know that that's so. Listen, Dr. Mori made some more tests on your sister, and he found traces of drugs. That can explain a lot of things, especially in a suicide. Betty was involved with drugs, but she hadn't touched the stuff for years, and I know that for a fact. If there were any drugs found in her system, they were forced on her. It's your father, huh? He's a very good-looking man. What's uh, that apartment upstairs? Uh, some kind of love nest? Interesting, this uh, bracelet. Doesn't it look like Florentine handiwork to you? I mean, um, like that bureau. Or the items that your uh, father sells in his antique shop in Florence. That's enough. If you suspect somebody, why don't you go to the police? Well, they think it was a suicide, and I don't have enough proof to change their minds. I mean, not yet. Change their minds? Isn't your name Paul? Yes, my name's Paul. So what? You might have some trouble changing their minds. After the massacre at Le Mans, where'd you go? You haven't been passing yourself off as a priest for very long, have you? I am a priest. You hear me? I am a priest. Why don't you try and show me some respect? You hear me? Show me some respect! Yeah, uh, he has his own little paperclips moment there, and he runs out, so that guy's creepy. Um, Can we just talk about how unstable every single man in this film appears to be? Yeah, they're all... They're all just messed up, man. Yeah, they're they're messed up. So, um, he gets into a cab, and as they're driving, he kind of... He has a seizure. He seizes up, and he... he uh, they kind of carry him out back into the church. He gets into his room, uh, and he gets some pills into him that help. So, uh, our, our buddy's got a, a small seizure problem, probably due to PTSD, uh, brought on by stress due to his uh, accident on the racetrack. Oh, he also um, could have brain damage from the amount of force in his brain bouncing around that every now and then he has a seizure too that's that's also very true yeah yep 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 that happens to a lot of race car drivers where there's like um concussive damage done to their brain that's quite severe from even just a simple accident just because no matter how much they're strapped down your brain's still floating around in a bunch of goo inside a hard case yeah it's, it's good stuff <laughs> I mean, it should should help everyone. Uh, Just say your brain was not meant to bounce around at high speeds. Yeah, it, it wasn't. It, it was. It was not meant to do that. No, that is. Uh, that isn't. Uh, that's an honest to god fact. Yeah. That night, she goes up to her dad's little love nest and goes through it. Uh, she gets a call from her uncle, who apparently does business with uh, her her dad they own a business together and he's going through all this stuff apparently her dad's place is a damn mess um he uh asks she asks about the orange envelope and he's holding his hands but says he doesn't see it but he'll keep looking for it for um after that she cleans up all of the girl's stuff that was laying about and she hears something and then also she was watching someone go through the place so she couldn't see who it is but she leaves she sneaks out and she hides the stuff in her place creepy caretaker guy that same night his dog is barking at something outside he thinks the dog is just seeing a, 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 a female dog in heat so he beats his dog so 
so he's the fucking worst person in the goddamn world right now. Uh, uh, we should biggest probably biggest villain in this movie. We should probably um, also give somewhat of a content warning for folks. Uh, yeah, this sequence is he actually does. It looks like he's actually fucking hitting that dog with that strap. Uh, yeah, it's it's bad. Yeah, and then like later he's like loving up on the dog and treating them all lovey dovey yeah. and all sorts. After of that, shit. he ties him to the radiator and and he says, "Good dog, you know, you'll be better now." And you're like, "Fuck you, dick." Um. And anyway, uh, so then the dog keeps barking and barking. So Simona comes in and she, you know, realizes it's him and, and, and unties him. And the dog runs automatically to the bathroom and she finds that the creep has hung himself. Well, the priest comes in and gets him down. Uh, he's hung from the wall, but th- from his belt. He gets him down and he tries to do CPR, but he dies. And that's the end of that 20 minutes. All right. So now we're we're starting to really question what's going on here because there are people that don't seem to have any reason to be taking their own life that just all of a sudden are just creeping up dead. Yeah, and, and what was that priest doing there just so conveniently? Right, like, we're starting to be like, what the fuck is going on? And now the priest is questioning and saying that, you know, his sister, quote unquote, didn't kill herself. So is this an extension of him trying to prove that his sister didn't commit suicide just because of some weird religious belief thing? He has to have it declared that she didn't commit suicide. Yeah, or or does he think she's mur- I don't know who the fuck knows. Yeah. Um, but does, she lived in this building, though, so of course he's going to have a, a an investor's interest in this place. Right. But the suicides aren't all happening just in this building, though, either. No, no, that is true. But she was in this building, so this is where it really comes down to kind of what she thinks. Yeah. You know, what he where he thinks that he needs to really investigate is here. Right. Well, let's just put it a little more succinctly in that two people have mysteriously committed suicide that were in the vicinity of this same building while our guy was investigating so he is clearly somewhat on the right track yes yeah he's uh he's got to get yeah he's he's on the right track now two people are dead um there's a lady who's uh, works in the morgue and she is he can even tell at least somewhat weird <laughs> right at best and <laughs> that's what you'd say yeah and there's also uh we need to kind of talk about there's the discussion going back and forth as uh, us as an audience we're actually being shown for the very first time a suicide that we are led to believe like what the fuck this makes no sense at all because yeah. the way that we saw it was the guy was going in there super happy and everything was fine and then the next thing we know he's dead mm-hmm. and it looks like an apparent suicide but we know as an audience that that's not what mood he was in so some Something's up. Yes. Uh, the previous suicides, we've seen all the aftermath. We haven't just seen um, them prior to, other than a little bit possibly of the corpse with a familiar face because the brother's talking about how he was talking to her and she didn't seem like it. So we are now able to take him at his word, I would say, because us as an audience, we have seen this gentleman who had no reason to kill himself apparently has committed suicide. And now we're starting to think something's up. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like it's oh, gi- yeah. it's giving credence to what it is that he has to say. So we're shifting from being him being being sus to him being possible team up investigatory guy. We need him to start looking into shit. And I think that's where the movie's starting to try and get us to go at this point. Yeah, that he's going to help this doctor try to figure out what the hell's going on. Right, because he's been aggressive, he's been super violent, and he's been a red herring up to this point. Yeah. And now we can kind of shift him into the, okay, well now we know that like he's on the up and up, but this really was his sister. He really is concerned that she committed suicide, so we can trust him, and now he's we're going to follow him, and he's going to investigate. That's where the movie shifts right here, with his death. Yes, this is fact. <laughs> Alright, well we start the next 20 minutes. Um... They are talking to an older lady who's friends or family with the caretaker. And she even says that he had tried this once before, that she shouldn't have left him alone. Um, Then uh, the priest and her... Now we see that the priest was definitely who met Red on the taxi because he's wearing the same outfit he was wearing before. Uh... I have a little bit of a problem here. Uh, right before they get in the taxi together, he and Simona, uh, my movie went to Italian. You didn't uh, have so subtitles no, in the file? Uh, I did not see any. All right. Well, I've been but in- this is the only little section that that happened in. Uh-huh. So I've been including um, subtitles without burning them in for you. You just have to select them through your uh, okay. MKV player thing. All right. Like I said, it's about 
a minute or two, right. if even that, uh, uh, the rest of English. So Yeah, okay, well, just to fill you in, as they're leaving, he is trying to convince her that his sister did not commit suicide, and she should actually be able to see and read between the lines that a lot of these suicides that are coming in may not actually be suicides, that something else may be up, and that's kind of what he's getting at, and somewhat mansplaining her job to her at the same time. And then, That's fun. And then when it cuts to English, she's still doing that, so it's just like that, yeah. that minute of dialogue is just like another like mansplainer phrase kind of discussion with her. Like he's trying to convince her, but he's doing it in a really, really wrong way. In a really uh, disgusting way. Right. I gotcha. Like, like he could, he could have very easily been like, look, you know, this stuff, I need your help. Yeah. Like, like this man probably didn't commit suicide either. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. Like there well, has anyway. to be something else. That's what it should have been doing, but they didn't do that. I gotcha. Well, they get into the cab and then, you know, English starts back up and he talks to her so that is our next clip i remember every word she said yes yes i was going i'm not used to being lucky i i was afraid afraid of luck what do you mean of what i represent no my luck in running into you Usually, when I've done some damn fool, done some damn fool thing, the only one that got hurt was me. This time, I've I've betrayed someone's good faith, someone that loved me. How have you done that, Betty? Don't ask me too many questions, or I'll lose my courage, Paul. I was about to play a rotten trick on the poor guy. Something really shitty. Sorry. I wasn't born a priest. I know, but you put me on edge just the same. As a matter of fact, you always have. But I love you anyway. I love you too. You're a good girl. You've always been. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm not. You know, we priests are something like magicians. Yes, I know. Then you know that if I absolve you, your sins go away. They disappear. Do you really think so? But first, I want you to tell that man everything. The one you hurt him. It won't be easy. Promise me. It was my own advice that killed her. That's why I have to discover the truth. You're unreasonable. I'm sure it's because you've lost your sister. But don't you think you should still be under treatment, Father Lennox? You think it's some sick fantasy of mine that there have been two very strange deaths? Why was the caretaker paid first and then strangled? What do you think of an idiot? He must have seen something. And as for your father's innocence, why is he in hiding? My father? My father? You don't even know him and you think he's guilty. You don't want the truth, you want revenge. And somebody to hate. My father's incapable of hurting anybody, but you are. Uh, I know I'm not... Worthy of the cloth I wear. But God will help me. If you really want to know the truth, then I'll help you too. She meets her dad's ex, the one who was wearing the red wig that made her remember about uh, everything else. All around her are pics of death. Um, autopsy photos, uh, men who have been ripped apart. It's kind of, it, again, it's one of those shocking things. It's horrific. Um, she's an artist of the macabre. She's into the, the, the macabre. And, um, they kind of have a bicker moment where she said they do not like each other very much. Uh, yeah, it's pretty much like daytime soap drama level of catty fucking back yeah. and forth between the two of them. And it's delicious and entertaining as fuck. Yes, it's, it's great. And then she even gets on her and she's like hey you know you know maybe you should watch how much you're hitting the bottle and then leaves like a boss and the girl actually the woman hits the bottle and uh that's fucking hilarious yeah i heard that fucking mic drop from across the room yeah 
Yeah, that's hilarious. And then takes off, the, the lady takes off her wig <laughs> because she's all mad about everything. Later on at the morgue, she sees a typewriter. She's like, who's been using it? And this guy's like, I don't think anybody comes in here during the summer. And she checks and written on this typewriter is her own suicide note. Uh, so she walks through this hall where all these murder mannequins are. Mannequins in like murder, in different murder situations. Well, she goes into a room which was unnerving the whole time. I thought that was really good. Uh, she goes to the room that it says she's going to kill herself in and goes in. It's the fire room, uh, firearms room. Well, the door shuts behind her and it's locked. She can't get out. Well, she finds the same suicide note pinned on a dummy. As she removes it, somebody tries to get her attention on the door. So she turns right in time as a gun goes off, blowing the mannequin away. If she, the person had come to the door, she'd be dead right now. And it would have looked like a suicide. So, damn. Uh, what an interesting and weird setup to try and get the suicide to happen. Right? It's insane, but I love it. <laughs> yeah, it was it was quirky and weird and like kind of darkly humorous and just really kind of fits with the rest of the tone of the movie because the movie doesn't know where it wants to be, whether it wants to be horrifically grotesque or also whimsically humorous. Yeah, it, it jumps back and forth with a lot of the dialogue and the way that these characters interact and stuff. And then it does this whimsically grotesque, humorous thing that fits perfectly in both worlds <laughs> with the way that she almost dies. And pretty much it's so surrealistic. You're kind of questioning if she even hallucinated that like she's been hallucinating the corpses getting up and fucking each other. Yeah, exactly. Which was hot. Good times. <laughs> um, so then she's resting at home and her dude friend shows up. The priest is already there. The priest asks dude friend to cheer her up so he does he cheers her up a lot and says that she and the priest are going to come watch him race because he's going to he's racing that day um well at the race they're all going and the priest can't handle it he says people are going to get hurt and he leaves see that's Just where i think they make it pretty obvious that he was the guy that was the race car yeah. driver that killed i mean we kind of know he's the race car driver now but the fact that he can't um, handle it and he loses his mind I, that's pretty much where yeah they, they drive that point home mm-hmm uh, I think they even guarantee it when the dude comes in uh, right before he sees her. He even confirms to the priest that he's the race car driver. Yeah, that he used to be. Because he said yeah. he was a big fan of his. Yeah, that's right. You're right. He does. Yeah. yeah. Um. So anyway, um, just after he leaves, uh, the dude's windshield gets shatters out. Almost looks like he gets shot out. And he crashes. His car's on fire and he's able to crawl out and escape, nearly getting hit by a car. Uh, See, I, he's able it looked to, get- to me like something got triggered to break it yeah like because it was quite square well, we, yeah it looked we like find it was... out later what happened right but anyway yeah yeah uh well we see her dad is there watching as well as she takes care of the dude uh later on they're together she shows her feelings towards him saying you know she does feel a, a very certain way about him and that she does not want to lose him and she wants the dude you know, to know that she does have feelings for him and she got really scared about what happened at the racetrack today um uh, he then shows her, pe- she actually says she wants to change. She wants to, she doesn't want to be the, uh, this cold person she has been. Well, he shows her these pics from Paris and it's all these people having parties and they're all nude and all that. And she starts getting into it and, um, she has the dude feel her up and then she goes down on him. But then she has a freak out moment and starts crying. And, you know, he comforts her and says, you know, I should really just take you away from this place. You shouldn't have to be here. And that's the end of that 20 minutes. All right. So she she's definitely got some stuff going on due to her job. Yeah, I think they're trying to imply something else as a sexual hang up besides just flashing back to the stuff going on with her job. Um, that could be too. But I mean, at the same time, she always sees corpses. <laughs> she freaks. Yeah. And she she's not as into it as you are. <laughs> right. Like, I mean, I don't see what her problem is. She starts picturing corpses while she's getting ready to have sex and it upsets her. Yeah. No. Court, that's an aphrodisiac. <laughs> right. That's not normal. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean that's not normal? <laughs> I'll tell you what's normal. <laughs> but in all seriousness, yeah, I get it. But like, I don't think it's necessarily just her job. I think it's the recent heat wave and just the revulsion of what she's had to deal with in just the most recent days. Because if her job really bothered her that much, she wouldn't have been able to make it through school to get to the point where she would be the autopsy yeah. 
Like, oh yeah, I, I mean, there's other stuff, but I think it's the so many of them uh, is 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 uh, causing maybe her more problems. Yeah, she's super overworked and it's stressing her out, and she hasn't had time to process this wave of death. And yeah, yeah. that is traumatic for human beings, absolutely. But the fact that that's keeping her from getting an orgasm—that's the part I'm having trouble understanding. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's not you. <laughs> I get that. But like, man, you got to detach so you can get off. Otherwise, you're going to go nuts. You're like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just basically saying, like, man, you got to compartmentalize because you're, yeah. you're not going to survive if you, if you don't with this kind yeah, of shit. Yeah, she, she's not learning that part yet. So yeah, um, I, I don't, I don't think that's the case. I think it's just that, I mean, she's clearly had a wave of death, the likes of which she and her coworkers have never seen on her yeah. hands currently, and I can see where that is driving her to the brink. Um, I'm just being facetious because, like, you know, lady can't get off right now because of all this, and sexual frustration is just. A thing for giallos it really is yeah i mean it's always like heat it's, i don't think i've ever seen it cold in a giallo it's always hot it's always in the middle of summer <laughs> <laughs> what's well, in fucking italy it's always fucking hot right yeah yeah i guess is it always hot i don't, I don't know, know what the temperature's like in italy <laughs> i have no I'm, uh, i was I'm taught well aware of... i was taught social studies in fucking america i know shit yeah. about other countries yeah. That's yeah, that's what I'm getting at too. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the American education system is just America good. Without America, we'd all be speaking whatever language and um uh, in America. And that's that's all I that's all I know. Well, clearly all giallos take place in the hottest days of the year that Italy has ever had on record because I don't think I've seen one that wasn't sweaty. <laughs> yeah, they're all sweaty and they're all fucking everyone wants to bone but no one's boning. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Not every single one of them is sweaty, and I'm sure one of them takes place in like you know the fall or like winter or some shit that we're forgetting. And people will correct us on that because our audience is good. They're astute. Yeah, our audience is very good. Yeah, they'll tell us what movie we fucking covered and which one took place in the dead of winter and why we were so very wrong. So the next twenty minutes starts. Uh, Dad meets up with his aunt, uh, ex and asks her for a favor, and that is to uh, he's going to make a call and he just wants her to make sure someone picks up. Uh, then, uh, the dad calls Simona and wants to meet her at home. He says, meet me at my home. I'm, he's, he's done of hiding and he needs to get some things straight with his daughter. It sounds like. So, uh, you know, all right. I dad, think, I think they're trying to make it cryptic. They're trying to make it, it's cryptic on purpose because they're trying to make it seem like maybe he's doing some of these killings and he's going to confess oh, yeah. to his daughter. Like, I feel like that's what they're doing. That's definitely what they're doing. Yeah. 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 They're, they're definitely trying to torque him up as... A, 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 a person of interest. <gasps> yeah, he's a fucking red herring. We can say it. He's a red herring. We can, yeah, he's, we, he is. He's red herring. <laughs> um, let's see here. Yep. So um, he uh, he gets into a car uh, that's picking him up, and we see uh, the person who is picking him up is none other than the priest. Uh, so, uh oh, and that's our next clip. You know the way. Now look. I told you the truth. I was in love with your sister, and I was going to marry her. We decided in Florence. Then she dropped out of sight, and the next time I saw her was in the papers, in those hideous photographs. Senor Sana, my sister told me she felt guilty about you, about something rotten she'd done to you, and that's why she was killed, and I'm absolutely certain of it. If you're telling me the truth, I think you'd better tell me who else I should suspect. Suspect? I don't suspect anyone. I think she killed herself. You supplied the reason, remorse. She killed herself, period. You're frightened. I'd have to be blind not to see it. Of whom? Of what? <laughs> Father Lennox. Oh, bullshit. So, uh, the dad gets home, and we see that woman who was friends with the caretaker. She's watching, and she's looking all sorts of particularly creepy and sweaty. Um, so then, uh, uh, the dad finds his brother in his apartment, kind of going through the place. And he has the letter from Betty, and that's our next clip. What are you doing here? Waiting for you. Straightening up your disorder, as usual. I open this, it's signed Betty. Is she the one who was in the papers recently? Dear Johnny, I would have liked to have become your wife. 
but I betrayed your trust, and so I'd rather go away. But before I do, I want to ask you to forgive me for taking this way out, and for taking this document from you. I'm returning it now. Please, try not to hate me too much. Betty. A letter of farewell? No. This is a suicide note. I was right. This should convince that priest. Where's the document? That's what I was wondering. Where's that document? You're not here. You to me. There was nothing it's else. It's robbery. Understand? You understand? Nothing else. It's I swear. Robbery. Now you try to be reasonable. You'll pay for this. I swear to God. This time you'll pay. Our partnership is finished. Swindles, frauds, tricks. The document. The document was you there. You too far. You're lying. <clears throat> I won't be involved anymore. You're a failure. You're a failure. Jesus Christ, man. Yeah, man. Uh, not the best brotherly relationship, I guess, in the world, but oh well. <laughs> we're, uh, we're pretty much O for every fucking guy on screen for having a meltdown moment. <laughs> yeah, every one of them are all having... Everyone, in fact, on this movie so far has kind of had a paperclips moment. <laughs> all right, fine. It's, uh, it's a little Who scary the there. took my paperclips? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Who in the fuck took my paperclips? <laughs> You're begging for it. You got it. <laughs> Thank you. It's about damn. Jesus Christ. Who in the fuck <laughs> took my paper clips? Have I played it enough for you yet? Or do you feel satiated? Uh, I feel, yes. I feel like I've had enough. <laughs> so um, that night, uh, Simona has visions of her dad plowing Betty. It's a weird thing for a daughter to have visions of, but okay. <sighs> well, clearly she suffers from the same kind of anxiety that you and I do, my friend, because, I mean, look at the way her mind works. You don't want to think about that kind of shit, but you know your brain goes to those kinds of areas, and you don't want yeah. it to with well, anxiety. It, it, you're not wrong. Yeah. I mean, it's it's all over the place there. <laughs> I mean, it clearly that's what it is. It's an anxiety fucking night induced nightmare. That's what she's having. Yeah. Yeah. And uh so I mean, that's too bad uh for her. Um anyway, um she actually goes to the hospital and for some reason the elevator's not working. So she has to fucking go through use the stairs and she's not all that pleased about having to do that. Uh while she's going through there, she's hearing moans. And I don't know, we don't know if that's in her head or real. Uh, well, then, later on, we see at her dad's place, the dog is barking up at the the top of the building, and then we see her dad falls right off the right off the balcony. So, dad's dead. That was an intense so, fall, even though it was a mannequin. Uh, um, oh, God, it was a, it was intense, and then the way it landed was intense. Oh, And then when they cut to it, Everything about they, this movie is pretty intense. Yeah, I mean, the mannequin drop, it's very clearly a mannequin, but the way that they do it, and they make it happen so quickly, and it's so abruptly, where it starts and finishes, that the shock is not wearing off by the time you are still like hey wait that was a mannequin and then yeah. they show you the body or the aftermath and the effects they do for his broken body after bouncing off the pavement are pretty fucking good too oh dude it is yeah it is it's horrendous it's it's gross oh it was bad <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it was. <laughs> it was. It was not something I enjoyed. Yeah, it was grotesque. Uh, it was intense, and uh, they did a really good job with a lot of the deaths in this film. For 1975, it's amazing how much this stuff is still as effective as it is on us after everything that we've seen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I agree. It's um pretty fucking horrific. Um, so um at the hospital, Simona uh confronts her uncle, and he's like, oh, "I just got into town." She's like, "No, nah, I called." And I know you've been in Rome for days. So she talks to the doc and the dad, the doctor says her dad's going to be paralyzed almost pretty much from the mouth down. He's going to be pretty much a vegetable, uh, most likely, if he lives. The priest tries to comfort her, but she blows him off, said, you know, you hated my father. Fuck you. Go go to hell. Uh, eat shit and die. Um, uh, so is that a paperclips moment? Yeah. Yeah. Who she is a paperclips moment on him. Paperclip. Who in the fuck took my paperclips? She, she, she pretty much says, you know, thank you, fuck you, bye. Um, More or less. Justifiably so, because he has been on her dad's back because of his sister and all that stuff. And so after what happened to her father, she's lashing out at him. That's that's also a pretty good fact, yeah. So uh, Simona is studying Betty's body and finds an ejection point on Betty. Uh, so she knows she was drugged before being killed. And she knows now it can't be her father because her father hated Needle. Uh, 
Um, the creep doctor then gets creepy again, talks about how, you know, he likes her body and all that. And then he gets super rapey and tries to rape her. Oh, uh, he He's gets get right up actual rapey. Yeah. He tries Yeah, Yeah. To. I'm saying yeah. he gets rapey. He tries to rape her. It's, it's a phone. It's a, it's a raping. <laughs> this is, this is bad. This is, this, this is, this, this is sexual this is assault. Rape is. Yeah. It's thwarted, yeah, is but it is sexual assault. This is wrong. Yeah. This is very wrong. So, uh, <laughs> so he, uh. She actually gets a fork and cuts him with it, and he gets then freaked, and he turns into a fucking, like most rapists are, uh, deep down, a coward. And uh, he starts crying, and he cha- she chases him. She starts, like, saying, just fuck it, I'm done. She chases him. She starts stabbing him and shit, and, and she's getting ready to kill him, but her dude man shows up and stops her from doing it. Uh, they, he takes her back to his place and kind of blames her for it. You know, hey, you, you can't blame the, he even says you can't blame the guy because guys like that love the chase because she's so cold. Yeah, it's victim cold, blaming. Cold it's f- fucking disgusting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Gross as shit. That's, that's some bad, bad stuff. Well, this right is there. where yeah. I had my paperclips moment at the film. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I do not fucking blame you. What the fuck? But then he blames her also for the murders, kind of, then strips her down and they have sex. And it's gross because of how he did that. Yeah. Um, this is not enjoyable at all to watch. I agree with no. you. I Yeah. No thanks, movie. Yeah. Thank, thanks, movie. <laughs> but uh, no thanks. That's uh, that's that's not that's not cool, movie. <laughs> Bad movie. Yeah. My, rea- Bad movie. my reaction to this sequence. I hate it. Yeah. I so, hate it. The next day, she meets with the priest, and that's our uh, next clip. It wants to kill me. I'm afraid. You should have confided in me sooner. I might have been able to help you. Confide in you? How can I confide in you if you hate me? I had to find somebody else, and we made love. But that's not a sin. I was really making love with you. I love you. I'm sorry I love you. But I do. I love you. Please, Simona, don't hurt yourself so much. I'm not hurting myself. You're hurting me. Why do you have to hide behind your cloth? You are a man, aren't you? In my dreams, you are. I made love with somebody else. But really, it was you. What do your awful vows mean? You were sick when you took them. They don't count. Please, Simona, don't blaspheme. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Simona, I love you, too. I'll never give up my vows. But I love you. As much as a man like me can love anyone. I know a 16-year-old kid who's paralyzed like your father. Somebody who's hurt at Le Mans? Yes, a kid involved with my accident. Anyway, he has this machine with which he can express himself with just the movement of his eyes. I know. There's something like that in experimental psychiatry. I know what you mean. You mean my dad? You mean... You mean he could communicate with him? He could tell us everything? Yes. Then maybe this nightmare will be over with. Come on. So, uh, they have the session with the dad, and, uh, when he's spelling out the letters, for some reason it looks like he's spelling out, uh, her name. The daughter's name, but then he starts having a, 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 an issue, and they inject him with some medicine that's supposed to help, but it ends up killing him, and he dies. Um, the police will investigate it, but then we cut to a cardinal talking to the priest, saying, you know, we spoke to the police, the church pulled a lot of strings, but you can now leave. And the priest's like, I don't want to leave, this is where my work is. And he goes, nah, come on, don't let's not do this, you need to get the fuck out of here. Well, as he goes back to his room, one of the other priests says a lady left something for him, a package. He thinks it's Simona and goes to run after her. Later on, Simona meets with Dad's ex. And she says she saw Dad with the priest the night he got thrown off the roof. The Padre then checks out the package that was given to him. And it's a book. It's a Bible. And as he goes through there, he notices there's two blank pages that have ink spots on them that look like a letter had been placed in between them. Uh, then we see the dad's bro. He's he's leaving. He's getting the fuck out of Dodge. And... 
and uh, then the priest jumps into his car. He's looking for a lift. He was like, hey, I think you should probably give me a lift. Let's go. And uh, not so nicely uh, makes him give him a lift. And uh, <laughs> that uh, ends that 20 minutes right before we go into our final 20. All right. So the sequence where they're like, there's that forced sex where the guy basically takes off her clothes and just goes after her. I think yeah. because she was wanting the priest so much, she just basically pictured being made love to by the priest which yeah. we didn't comment on that because we were so outraged by the actual like rape that they're trying to show us as a sex scene yeah um, so- although i didn't know she was so much into the priest until she said it because it just a few scenes before that after that guy's car wreck she admitted that she did have feelings for him and was scared that he had gotten hurt so i think she's massively confused as well right but i mean she is picturing the priest the face priest now when, when yeah, she was when she was being assaulted but then yeah. like somehow turn, turned away to make it like into where she was making she had sex with the dude she pictured the priest and that made her realize while she likes this dude she's in love with the priest right okay and like we didn't talk about that because we were upset about the actual way the sex with the way with how it happened yeah yeah we were not happy about that yes i i totally agree there um so we it's weird that they jump back and forth so much with how much she's gonna love or hate the priest and it doesn't coincide with what happens with her father enough where like her father falls off the building and she automatically hates the priest she should have been lashing out and hating him whenever that thing that made her be more suspicious of him yeah you know when like someone's like oh i saw them together that night like then she should be colder to the priest like there's certain things that are happening in an order that don't make sense because like now that she thinks that the priest may have been involved in her father's death and she now wants to be back with the priest again we need to like change that up a little bit between when she's actually yeah, angry with him i think it's weird as well but uh yeah yeah i don't know really you can't really you, i don't make any sense of that at all either so there's like a time like when certain things happen in certain time frames in the movie where it doesn't make sense that they're happening in the time frame that they're happening in um and it kind of adds to that disoriented nature that the rest of the film's giving you anyway because like the way that a lot of these characters are acting they are all clearly overheated and it's like really fucking hot and they're all very uncomfortable and they're all just trying to like just stay cool and keep calm and like temperatures are flaring up everywhere because of how fucking hot it is and it, it's it really works it helps keep the tension going in the film you know quite a bit because no matter what no matter how calm everybody is they're still fucking sweating their <laughs> fucking genitals off yeah it's still fucking hot <laughs> yeah it's still everybody's fucking miserable and like you know they're all within like their wits end anyway and to add this all up there's a fucking wave of suicides and then a wave of murders that are trying to cover up murders to be suicides and they're trying to differentiate what's happening and the priest is involved this lady's falling in love with him all of this drama is just being thrown on top of this murder investigation and all this other shit that's going on that's so fucking jolly and there's just so much shit packed into this movie i can't believe there's all this story going on Yeah, right? There's just There's a lot of stuff happening right now. Right. <laughs> like, even some characters are getting fucking plot lines and, like, subplots and, like, love stories and shit. And, like, it's so yeah. hard to follow. But at the same time, like, it's so rich that you could just watch it again and follow another plot line that you completely abandoned and forgot about. <laughs> You yeah, I know, to. right? It's great. <laughs> <laughs> I do not envy you your job of trying to keep this all in your notes, man. It, it was not a lot of fun. It was not the, the easiest movie, but at least it was interesting. Right. But I'll <laughs> it tell you a lot worse. I'll tell you, you're doing an excellent job. I got nothing to add. And like, you definitely kept better track of it than what I did, obviously. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, final 20 minutes. Uh, Simona tells, uh, the, the kind of the, the caretaker's lady friend who now I guess is taken over as a caretaker. She says she's leaving for the day and Simona's like, that's fine. I'm just going to sleep all day. So don't worry about me. I'm, she's fine. Can't blame uh, her. Apparently. Yeah, no, uh, you know, she went through a lot of shit. So, uh, you're, you're going to need a break every now and then. Uh, she dreams of Betty's corpse accusing her of being the murderer. 
of uh, being always jealous of her and her dad and the stuff they were doing. So she's got a lot of a uh, lot of survivor's guilt. To say the I least. I mean, obviously. Yeah, to say the least. There's a there's a lot of survivor's guilt here. Um so you 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 know you I feel bad for her. Um then um she is showering and she starts hearing footsteps. Uh, there's a lot of moments here where I can give thank you movies to. Just uh, trust me that there's a lot of thank you movies to give out here. <laughs> yeah, there is for lack of a better term. There is nudity in this film that you are allowed to enjoy as a moral yeah. human being. Absolutely. Yes. Morally, I, I feel all right. Yeah. <laughs> and then there is other nudity that even myself you, will allow myself to enjoy, like in the morgues and stuff that you won't. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's. Yeah. I can't do that part. Um, right. I can't go there. Right. <laughs> And if, um, if you are also the kind of person that can detach your brain from the things that are happening just to be able to enjoy the nudity, you know, like, and just detach yourself from the story just to look at the nudity, then, yeah, you could probably enjoy just a, pretty much all of it. But Yeah, probably. Yeah, but Matt and I can't do that, so we don't. We don't. <laughs> we don't have that kind of fun. Where's all the fun? When do I get to have all this fun? Um... So anyway, uh, then we cut, she, so she hears footsteps. Well, we cut to the Padre and Uncle, and they're talking, and that is our next clip. Tell me, Lennox, why did you want to come here? I have been in Florence since the flood. What a disaster for Florence. But at least it was the first time in history that youth from all over the world worked side by side to recover and save the great works of art that belong to all humanity. I was with them. How many paintings and precious books were lost? And then some were saved. Like this one, perhaps you've seen it before. It's a very rare edition. Aren't you surprised to find it in my hands? I know nothing about it. I imagine you have a department for book restoration in this place. You imagine or you already know? Nel pieno possesso. Uh, Mol allore. Malalore, huh? It might be being of sound mind and a full possession of my faculties. And even though this cost me much pain, a will. Get out of here, Lennox. I will not tolerate your insinuations of blackmail. You won't tolerate blackmail. But you might practice it, right? Where did you buy it? Look, either you're going to tell me or I'm going to look it up in your records. Well, it's obvious you, uh, you got it before the flood. You know, this area suffered a great deal of damage, didn't it? But the Sano brothers made a great comeback and in record time. Did a, uh, little bit of, uh, luck help you through the crisis? In any case, I also happen to know that you had a fist fight with your brother the night he fell. the August holidays. Nobody's here. Where do you want me to go? He stole my car, my gun. He's dangerous. He's on his way to Rome for you. Why me? Probably because you're going to be his next victim. Anyhow, I warned you. <laughs> Good All luck. Right. I warned you. Yeah, I warned you. Get the fuck out. Um, so she starts losing it a little bit because, I mean, why wouldn't you? You just found out that somebody who so. you think you're in love with might be a murderer. Justifiably and coming so. for you. Yeah. 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 So uh, that's uh, that's scary stuff. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I wouldn't be a fan. <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, then she starts remembering everything, like all kind of like the uh, all of... I guess like all the things that are starting to add up that maybe makes the priest the 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 killer. Yeah, um, he's super sus right now. Yes. Yeah, she calls her dude and he's like, "Hey, are you all right? What's going on?" He's just helping his aunt with flowers. His aunt is damn near deaf. Um, he then goes upstairs and talks with his aunt, and that's our final clip. You know, I'm a lot like you, Aunt Elvira. Your patience, your attention to detail. Even so. Your life's tranquil and mine's a mess. My money is going through a very delicate period right now. Like your flowers in the sun. Both need care. Someone still presents a threat to my inheritance. It's all your brother's fault. I mean my father's. Oh, are you talking to me, Edgar? Papa! I was talking about Papa! <sighs> what a fine man my brother was. I'm going to take some flowers to him. 
He was a hard-headed fool. And you wouldn't have to take him flowers if he hadn't broken my balls when he was still alive. <laughs> Imagine him arranging to get his revenge from the grave. With that stupid business of hiding his will in the Bible. Christ. I wish I knew why the hell that priest went to Florence. He's another stubborn fool. His idiot sister. Poor Betty. You always said I was no good. You wanted to disinherit me. But you didn't make it, did you? Your will is right here. Safe and sound. The priest and Simona are the only ones left to give me any trouble. Dear Papa. I have to take care of them, too. So we find out that, um, well, the dude's been the killer this whole time. For what? What else? Fucking money. Yep. So just so his livelihood and his, uh, his, his, the way he does things doesn't have to change. And he can just be this playboy he wants to be his whole life. Uh, so, well, all right then. Sometimes uh, in order to make an omelet, which happens to represent the lifestyle of luxury and um, enjoyment and entertainment that he gets to indulge in, you have to kill lots of people. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, yeah, you can't, can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs, right? Right. You can't be rich and, you know, lead a life of luxury and leisure without murdering a bunch of people. Yeah. I mean, that's just how it is sometimes. So, sorry about your luck, folks. <laughs> Basically, that's what this guy's saying to them all, so. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of the lowest, lowest common denominator of scum, right? He's murdering people so he doesn't have to be uncomfortable. Yeah, so he doesn't have to maybe work ever yeah ever yeah what a piece of shit yeah he is uh he is a giant piece of shit that's uh that's not a good thing um later on the dude shows up and he talks to simone and uh they pours him pours them both a couple drinks and she uh all of a sudden starts feeling weird and he tells her the whole deal about how his father black her father simone's father found the letter blackmailed him into paying money so they wouldn't release the will um and that's why he got all pissy with her uh or all pissy with him and why everything kind of started um uh how everything was going so he's like that kind of started all the the problems originally um and uh he said the dad was the one who shot at his windshield he said your dad's a piss poor shot he's the one who shot at my windshield causing me all sorts of issues um and then the padre shows up but she can't move or warn him uh as the padre's checking on her uh the dude sneaks up behind him injects him they fight but he says hey you keep fighting it's gonna move faster and he tells him his sister was actually uh, the padre's sister was helping him to get the will from her dad and then it was her sister that his sister that really caused the problem because she backed out she was starting to feel bad and uh so she backed out and uh so uh and so he said you know he that's why when he saw her that night he drugged her got all the info from her about why she was backing out and send the letter without the will um he then strips them both in the bathroom poses them to make it look like a lover's thing they couldn't be together so they killed they they committed suicide together um and i don't know what did he turn on was that gas what was that yeah i think it was gas yeah yeah, it was like he turned on some gas and he leaves. Um, the uh, the priest though, he's able to he's able to get moving a little bit, and he gets to his pills and he breaks it open with his mouth. So I mean, ow, that had to hurt. Um, and then he goes, all right, he eats some of the pills and he's able to move a little bit and turn on the water, and the water just leaks. And so that's the last we see of it. Uh, he turns on the bidet and it makes the, the toilet bidet. overflow. Yeah. All right. At least I think that's what it was. I, I'm not 100% I sure. Think, I think you're right. I think it was definitely the bidet. So anyway, then we cut to the dudes back up on top of the buildings taking pictures of statues. And he sees the two drive up in a car. They are alive and very well. The Padre climbs all the way up to the top. They struggle. He wants to kill himself. The dude does. The Padre is trying to stop him. Then he tries to take the Padre with him. They continually fight one another constantly. And finally, uh, the guy gets flung over. The Padre is trying to pull him back up, but the guy just sort of goes limp. And the Padre loses a grip, and the guy falls to his death. Roll credits. All right, so 
Um, not exactly sure how to really phrase what it is that I'm thinking. All right. I just really don't. Um, the story is really, really well done. I found mm. the movie really entertaining and I really did like it. Uh, it just kind of feels like a rush to the end. Like most giallos, they do this where they want to give you this twist on the killer that they just dump a shitload of information on you at the end to say yeah. this is all information you didn't have and this is why you didn't know what was going on with the mystery. And I think that's the biggest thing that most mystery fans will find frustrating with giallo. But there's a lot of mysteries that do that too, though, where like yeah. they just dump it all on you at the end so they can make up an excuse as to why you couldn't figure it out and why all the red herrings were red herrings um, True. in this. Uh, but I will say the cases for a lot of the red herrings at the time that they're doing it were extremely plausible. So it was more of a find your way to the killer by process of elimination and then get lucky like what actually does happen to cops. Yeah. Because they never actually solve anything. They usually just get lucky. <laughs> They just don't even care. <laughs> right. They're just closing cases. They don't even care if you're actually fucking yeah. guilty. It's the truth. That's how cops work. Um, it was a good goddamn. <laughs> right. But anyway, it's like I am. I'm a little pissed off as a viewer that they just mm-hmm. like dump all this on you all at once. And like they didn't give you any hint at it or, you know, any reason why. <laughs> it's just like all this information that they should have sprinkled throughout the film, you know, because like I, uh, you know, something. Maybe I, I get. Uh, don't get me wrong. I get what you're saying. They did rush to the end. Because they used up a lot of time on a lot of story. I thought it was fun. All right. But like as as a, as someone who likes to go through the murder mystery and try and figure out the actual mystery and like figure out who it is and find the suspect, don't you find that kind of frustrating though? Or you're just willing to let it go? You don't care? I'm kind of willing to let that one go. I don't care. Um, I suppose you're kind of right. I would have loved to maybe more of a chance to try to figure it out myself. Uh, I think that would have been fun. Um, but... I, maybe with this Jallo, I didn't feel so much of the murder mystery as I did f- feeling just like this is going to be an uncomfortable movie to fucking watch and just buckle up and get into it. Well, this has some of the same kind of ground that Scream was working on that we've already talked about before. Yeah, where it's it's really just kind of self aware of what it's doing with with everything. It, it does it does have that feeling with it, you know, like yeah. And especially um, where all the motivations of the characters are ever changing and everybody's constantly frustrated and like, you know, just overheated and angry and it's jumping around with the emotional part of the storytelling. And then just all of a sudden revealing at the very end, you know, like you you basically have that same kind of stalking killer, but it's like more interpersonal teen drama. But in this case, it's the grown up drama, you know, with 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 them. So there's a lot of like heavy drama and like these life stories and these intermingling things that are going on and then oh by the way there are people that are actually being murdered so then we switch to murder mystery um everybody gets their suspect red herring moment and then the actual killer we never even spend any real time with at all in the film that is true we don't get to and he seems so aloof about it and his willingness just to kill himself after going through all this work to try to get this money instead of trying to i don't know do anything else seems weird to me as well right and i just want to state that even though i'm voicing some dissatisfaction with that in the way that it does it i accept that several movies do that sort of thing but the reason that i am kind of a little harder on this movie about it right now and i want to discuss it is because up until that point it was doing so fucking well and building so much fucking tension and yeah they could have spent just a little more time with the character and just have him talk about an inheritance thing or something or other or you know something Give us some kind of a reason. I'm having a little trouble with money right now or something. Right. Um, But I think they were too... They were too concentrated on making it so that you could not... The dude is the one guy who you just would not suspect. Yeah. I, I I really think that's what they wanted to do. Yeah, I just, I don't know. Like, it, like I said, it's more mystery novels whenever they do it in the novel. Because you're supposed to be, when you're reading the book, trying to figure it out on your own and see if you can figure it out. Because then when you figure it out, you know, you feel better, you know. And yeah. there's there's cheats that mystery books have done like that, you know. And I, I'm still a little sore about it when it happens in movies sometimes. <laughs> I, don't, I don't blame you at all. Yeah. I, I mean, I get that. I think it's just... Uh, just the fact that, you know, unfortunately, it's just uh, 
They, they had a one way of they wanted to do it, and they didn't really want you to maybe figure it out yourself. They wanted to do whatever they wanted to do. Yeah, it's not. That's the thing is this uh, this isn't a typical murder mystery, although it poses itself to be. It's very much like Scream in that it's doing its own thing. It's very aware that it's using the murder mystery frame, but it's telling you a different story, throwing in some heavier drama, and then just dumping the part that makes the, you know, why the killer is the, or who the killer is and why they're the killer. The killer, and then you lose them immediately. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's the same like proto slasher thing you know like that same kind of vibe you know that 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 going that's going on and i just i don't know i felt kind of disappointed because the mystery was so good and it had me so involved all the way up and then i just felt cheated and that's what i'm bitching about really is i just yeah. like i feel like they dropped that mystery thread like right at the last second and it just made me sad <laughs> But every well, every you know cello what? does this though. Like almost all of them do it. So you know, I just I just have to deal because it happens with me with every Jallo. I'm sure. Yeah, and I still think it was a fine movie to watch. Well, that's they kept me. Th- listen, kept that's it. Th- up. That's it. That's my last. That's my sole negative thing I have to say. Every th- every yeah. other piece of praise that I've heaped upon this film, I absolutely still it's, feel 100. percent And it far yeah. outweighs that minuscule disappointment thing. So yeah, I'm, I agree. I mean. Like the special effects are incredible. They are grotesque. It's really hard to look at this shit, and it's so hard to believe that that was 1975 that it was done in. I mean, I, yeah. I can't praise that stuff enough. Um, the acting we made light of a lot of the paperclips moments, but when these people needed to have a meltdown, they had an actual meltdown. Like, yeah, and it was really well performed. Mm-hmm. Even the folks, if it was their voices were dubbed later, whoever was dubbing the English language version of it did an excellent job of matching the face uh like the facial expressions of the character and the body movements and the way that they are carrying themselves they did an excellent job with that um each of them uh whenever that was happening so like even even the acting and the the drama stuff was great i mean it, it leads you up with this great murder mystery and like really dangles all these red herrings out and it keeps making you wonder if maybe you discounted this character a little too soon you know yeah and like it, it's all of that stuff is absolutely excellent and then like i said just that, that the disappointment thing at the end that's just me belly aching about jalos not getting the part of the mystery that i love the most is being able to actually figure out who it is yeah <laughs> you know that's that's what i love in my murder mysteries I and mean, that's not what giallo is that's totally fucking fine there are proto slashers my man and I got to get over it. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> well, I think we've been talking about this more than long enough for tonight before we're going to do any PSYOP news. So anything else you have to say about the movie before we move on? No, I got nothing. All right. Well, let's just end this fucking show with this fucking promo. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcasts, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.
from the album Severed Survival, the title track on track eight, Severed Survival, from Autopsy, the band who loved this movie, Autopsy, so much they took their name from it. Autopsy! (laughs) That is, well, if you are listening on the Pirate Radio Edit, if you are listening on the main feed currently, which, by the way, the difference is whether or not you are a Patreon subscriber, the Pirate Radio Edit is still a part of the Legion Podcast Patreon, because the bots be scrubbing everywhere but there, so that's the show that I get to bring you the way I want to bring it to you. And I know there's yes. like seven of us right now listening to it. So, you know, let's get those numbers up on the Legion there Patreon. Are dozens of us. Dozens. <laughs> I would like tens of you at least <laughs> at some point to know that there are at least <laughs> tens of you out there listening on the Pirate Radio Edit on the Legion Patreon just to, you know, make me feel better. Yeah. yeah. Even if I'm one of the tens. Even if one of the te- The tens. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag make it the tens of you. <laughs> If you'd like to find other instances where we made up bullshit hashtags to try and segue into something else and then failed miserably at it, you can look at that on our main landing and or launching page, legionpodcast.com forward slash cinema dash psyop. Somehow I made that successful. Yeah, that was really good. You can also Um, find our Instagram feed, uh, cinema underscore psyops there. That is where all of our memes are dropped for the people to share. Yeah, well, of course. You gotta be able to share the meme. <laughs> I mean, listen, we are socialistic with our memes, all right? <laughs> Your memes are our memes. <laughs> I got nothing to add on to that. Well, you can also tweet a couple of tweets to a couple of twats on the formerly hate-filled shitfest known as Twitter that has been reformed into a porn bot heaven. I am at court underscore psyop there, and he is at psyop Matt. Porn bot heaven. Mm. He swears he's only keeping his uh, Twitter because that's where he keeps in contact with the fans. That has nothing to do with all the porn bots that he'd be following after I'd be following him. P- porn bots? Never heard of such a thing. Where did one even find such a bot? Uh, it's on Twitter on my followings. <laughs> You can also join our Facebook group, Cinema PsyOps, where the bots be scrubbing and there be no porn. But hey, there's some great discussion going on still and all sorts of stupid, weird memes like we shared on our Instagram feed of Cinema underscore PsyOps. So the group is aptly named Cinema PsyOps there on Facebook groups. Yeah, well, there you go. I am also available. That's convenient. <laughs> I am also available there as Court PsyOps, and Matt exists in a way that you can tag him there to talk about when he's been ghosting you and for how long in a post that he will never look at. I mean... Listen, man, it sounds like you're 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 kinda you know, you're gaslighting me right now. All right. That's what it sounds like to me. You, so you could also attempt you to stop. You could also attempt to email feedback to Matt, psyopmat at gmail dot com, but let's face it, he has never looked at that either. I don't know what you're talking about again you are gaslighting if you would actually like to get a hold of someone that has any decision making on this show at all aka he runs barter town you can email me cinema court at gmail.com that is true you do run barter town i can't i mean i don't think anybody would lie about that or or disagree and if they did what the fuck i run the barter town that is this show but our listeners while you are out there running your own personal barter towns kick the fuck out of this week and make it your bitch
Hello, you hear me? Yep, I hear you. you hear me? Yep. Okay, just wanted to make cool. sure because things got weird there for a second. Yeah, my shit got really weird there for a second as well. So, <laughs> and so I was like, eh, I better make sure he can hear me because this is not sounding great. <laughs> All right. What about now? You sound okay to me now. You yeah, you it. sound good to me. So. Okay. I think we had a bad connection at first and then it straightened up because I got that weird boop boop noise uh, at the beginning that indicates that. Yeah, and I that... think one of, the, one of the ports on my laptop was bad. So I had to plug my head my headphones into a different port because you were coming through just on the laptop speakers and not my headphones, ah. which would make a really weird podcast. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> yeah, and I'm recording hear... now, by the way. Okay. Well, One, two, three. Thank you. Yep. All right. Uh, yeah, you being on speakers is bad enough because I still have to go in and like like right now where I'm talking, I'm going to have to go in and highlight this section of me talking and explaining to you what it is that I have to do and uh-huh. then select your tracks and highlight where you are sitting silently, particularly on your side of the recording because you have your headphones up so goddamn loud it gets picked up by your snowball. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Let me lower my, my volume then. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, all right. As long yeah, as talk you, to me. Okay. As long as you can hear me, you don't have to have it up like full blast. I know your hearing's a little off and iffy and like loud is just your default state for everything. Yeah. I mean, that's not wrong. Uh, <laughs> you, oh, you inherited I, it honestly, though. You know, it's not really your fault. And I, yeah. <laughs> I'm not blaming there, you for I'm it. I'm sorry. Now things should be, <laughs> should be coming through. Okay. There we go. That should be better. <laughs> it's really weird. I've noticed it in the last, like, I want to say, like, like six months that we've been recording, I've noticed that I've had to go in and do that and highlight a section where I'm talking and you're not. Well, I'm getting fucking old, you know? <laughs> I'm sorry, what? What? <laughs> All right, I haven't downloaded the clips yet because I just got down here, so I'm going to do That's that real fine. quick. If it'll fucking let me, it'll be fine. For some reason, my particular Chrome browser is fucked, and it oh. just... Chrome, Chrome and Apple just don't work at all. Just, they're, they're not, they're not good for one another. No, and I use, I like I said, I still use Chrome, but there are certain things like sometimes it'll download and everything will be fine. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes I can't fucking upload. It's the, it's the back end API shit of like uploading and downloading files and that stuff that yeah. for some reason the Chrome browser and fucking Apple products are not friends. I don't know why. You, you think they would want to do that? I love what I'm changing uh, because like really none of our work shit works on Microsoft Edge really well so we usually set people up on Chrome and you go to change the default browser and Microsoft gets all bitchy at you and goes are you sure you don't want to experience this brand new awesome browser? You're like yeah I'm pretty fucking positive asshole Well here's okay case point perfect uh, Chrome told me that I downloaded the clips and that it was done and then I checked my yeah. download folders that it said it downloaded to and guess where it wasn't? Oh it wasn't in there motherfucker. Yeah and it may be because I'm using older Macs that are shit I will uh, you know I will definitely concede that, but it is what it is. It was what it was. Yeah. I think I'll have enough time to download the clips and get them put in place while we do the start of the show. So let's just fucking start this. You did Autopsy from 1975, right? Yes. All right. Well, at least we have that going for us. Here we go. Let's fucking start the show. Shit. Whoops. I fucked up. I fucked up. I fucked up. I copied all the music over and I got it all arranged and I had it all set and ready to go. And then, nope, didn't fucking put it in. Here we go. Three, two, one. Do we ever get an answer as to what that fucking was supposed to mean? Because I don't remember getting one. Where, where he's uh, the, killed a lot killed, of people. That, that, that he killed the 12 people in his race car wreck. Okay, so he's the one that killed. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, he's I, the race car guy. Right, so, but um, he's just losing his fucking mind, but we don't. He just moves it. He lost his shit because he qu- killed 12 people. How obvious did the movie make it that he was the race car driver? Pretty obvious. The priest. Uh, the way he drove uh, when, when he, you know, when he picked her up, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But yeah, but they were hinting at it and everything the, the whole way through. But did they ever come right out and say it? Yes, I think so. Later on, when they talk about ways that he could help her father to be able to communicate after his accident. Okay, yes. Now, I, okay, yeah. Sorry, it's just a fucking long day. When I, yeah, when I watched no, it I get now. you, man. Yeah. I get you. Yeah, yeah, I had to think about it, too. I'm like, I thought they did, but you know what, what the fuck do I know at any point in time? Okay, in yeah, that, that shit's all coming back to me now, but there's so much other stuff in this movie that that subplot, like, totally just went by the wayside, if you know what I mean. Oh, yeah, I got you. Okay. I understand totally. Yeah, let's, we'll um, just, well, I'll take this conversation and I'll remove all the stuff where I'm confused and move it to the outtakes. It's fine. Sorry. The, nope, not a problem. She then later on meets her dad's ex, the lady who was wearing the red wig, uh, you know, that made her was like, hey, okay, so this is uh, an idea uh, that uh, maybe 
my dad's caused. Uh, and, um, I got fucking lost again. Hold on, Jesus Christ. Um, all right, three, two, one. See, I don't feel you that don't bad like about it. forgetting that entirety of that car racing plotline for the priest because of all of this shit. It, like, clearly kept that fresh in my mind over again. Running our own personal barter towns. Running our own towns. personal barter towns around here. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the worst, but it's also not the best I've ever done for a segue. Yeah, you know what, though? It's good enough. It's it, good enough. We did really good on this review. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't think anybody should be judged on this. Are you? St- are you still recording? <laughs> I am not now.